This happened several years ago, and I was reminded of it recently. It was bizarre enough that I had to ask my wife, who had been with me at the time, if I had just imagined it all. It was late at night, but still about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, just north of the border to Mexico. We were on a side road that had one sidewalk up against a wall on the right, and to the left was an open field with large rocks. I was the one driving. We had driven this road almost daily, so we were very familiar with it. The radio had been working poorly, so I decided to turn it off. We were both kind of tired, so maybe our perceptions were off. Maybe we only noticed this whole thing because we didn't have the radio on. As we kept driving on, I saw that there was a man laying in the gutter in a light blue button-down shirt. Blue jeans, brown shoes, face down in the dirt, still just below the sidewalk. This occurred within a few seconds, but it all felt like it took way longer. My wife wanted me to stop and make sure he was breathing. I slowed down the car and pulled over, but on instinct, I told my wife to stay in the car. All my internal alarms were going off. I could hear my own heartbeat, and I felt like I was being watched. She knows to trust me when I have moments like this, so she looked a little more critically at the situation. The following description is a combination of what the both of us noticed. There were boulders from the field that had been dragged closer to the road. We could see the streaks of fresh soil. It was really obvious that they had just recently been moved. On the far side of the recently moved boulders, I could just barely make out a bluish light, as though someone facing away from the road was reading something on their phone, just out of sight. The light turned off as soon as I looked that way. As I looked closer, I could see the man laying in the gutter was definitely breathing. There was no blood at all near him, and his back and sleeves were completely clean. If he had been hit by a car or fallen in, he'd be dirty, right? We had to go. I just knew it. I punched the gas pedal, and we got the heck out of there. I looked back in the rear view mirror, just to see five men running out from behind the boulders. They had been running at the car, and stopped when we started to speed away, but all of them stood there watching us leave. One of them walked over and helped up the man who was laying down. When we got to our destination, I called the police and reported it, but they basically told me to just sit on it and spin. A few days later, the news reported that there was an attack at night, location undisclosed. In this particular town where a person pulled over their car when they saw a man lying in the road, and they were attacked by the man and his cohorts. Thankfully, though, the victim managed to escape. In my formative years, I was frequently sent to stay at my grandparents' house as both of my parents worked odd hours and struggled to take care of me during shifts. At such a young age, this was simply a time for me to eat as much candy as I wanted and stay up until midnight watching Cartoon Network. The only thing that made my stay with the grandparents better was when my cousin Carly was also staying with them. My grandparents lived in a house that bordered a major highway, and as such had a large brick sound barrier between the main road and the alley that ran behind the houses. This sound wall was getting old, and there were places in need of major repair. One such place was at the far end of the alley, right near the local park. Behind a nice set of shrubs, the wall had been slowly crumbling and was the perfect size for two eight-year-olds to squeeze right through. Now, the location of this wall, the shrubs, and their relation to my grandparents' house is all important. The shrub itself covered the crack in the wall perfectly from the road. You couldn't see it at all until you stepped behind the shrub and bent down due to how low it was to the ground. The wall itself was at the far end of the alley, of which my grandparents' house was second or third at the start of the alley. According to Google Maps, 
The alley is about a thousand feet long from house to crack. Once you've reached the crack in the wall, the alley turned left and continued for another 500 feet until it dumped down into the main street. Carly and I like to walk along the alley with a bag of cookies, slip right under the crack and walk to the other side of the road to play at the playground. This being the 90s, we had no adult supervision beyond us vaguely shouting to our grandparents that we were headed to the park. On this occasion, however, Grandma was out at the store, and Grandpa was gone to some church event. Now, they hadn't told us we could leave the house, but they also hadn't told us we had to stay inside either, if you catch my drift. In the past few days that Carly and I had gone to the park, there were always people there due to it being a weekend. As it was full of people those days, I don't remember this detail but Carly told me a few years ago that she remembers seeing the same gray van parked alone at the park the two days in a row. On this Monday, however, the park was deserted. Carly and I were having a blast, swinging and sliding with no kids to get in our way. We were so preoccupied that neither of us remember seeing a charcoal gray Dodge Grand Caravan pull up and park right there in the parking lot. After a little while, Carly pulls me down the playground into one of the plastic tunnels and tells me to be quiet. Chris, I think that guy in the van is watching us, she told me. He's been there on his phone for a long time now. I not so subtly peeked my head out of the tube. I saw the man staring right back at me, as if he knew exactly where we were hiding. He indeed had some kind of phone in his hand, and was talking at a rapid pace. And Carly and I decided we would get out, swing some more as to not seem suspicious, obviously, and then head home at a brisk walk. I reasoned with Carly that he wouldn't follow if he didn't think we were running from him. Solid logic, I know. Looking back, I realize now just how dangerous of a situation we were in. The situation started to get even worse when the man hung up his phone and got out of the van. He stepped out of sight to the driver's side sliding door, and we saw him open it up. I got my very first bad feeling of the afternoon, and basically whisper shouted to Carly, We need to go now! We pop off the swings, and run at as close to a dead sprint as we can. We left our basketball and cookies right where they were. As we reach the park fence, we hear the sliding door slam, and the driver door closed shortly after that. We look back to see the van sliding out of its parking place, and we bolted across the road. Carly started to shimmy into the crack behind the shrub, but I was behind watching the van. Instead of coming down the road we ran across, the van drove straight and disappeared from view. This is when my second very bad feeling kicked in. I grabbed Carly's shirt and pulled her back out of the crack, telling her that we needed to go another way. We both start walking down the main highway, cars whizzing by on the other side of the sound wall. As we reach the end of the wall and started to turn into the subdivision, we catch ourselves when the gray Dodge pulled out of the alley and turned down the street in front of my grandparents' house. We gave the van a good five count and then sprinted to the alley to make it inside the backyard. At this point, we bolted inside, locked every single lock we could find, and both grabbed kitchen knives. We headed to the living room. I don't know what we thought we could do with said knives, but we placed them on the ground and turned on some cartoons. A little while later, creepy man forgotten, I went to the kitchen to grab a Mountain Dew. Now my grandmother had this beautiful full wall glass window sitting area put in a few years prior. It had no shades or curtains. I thought nothing of this, until I looked out and noticed a charcoal gray Dodge Grand Caravan slowly making its way down the street. With an eight-year-old's version of, oh shit, I jumped back and ran to the living room to tell Carly what I had seen. We both proceeded back to the kitchen, like the little dumbasses we were, and peered over the ledge of the sitting area. The Dodge was stopped right in front of the house, and the man was staring right through the window back at us. At that exact moment, 
we both hear the garage door open to admit our grandmother and watch my grandfather come around the corner of the street. As soon as my grandpa parked his car in front of our house, Creepy McCreeper nonchalantly pulled away and slowly drove off. Our grandpa was more than a little miffed that we had locked not only the knob and the deadbolt, but also the floor lock, chain, and door jam lock on the front door. For context, the area they lived in could be comparable to South Dallas or some of the nicer areas of Chicago. Once our grandma let him in, we were threatened with a whipping for touching the locks until my grandma persuaded him it was just kids being kids. We both told them our story, but neither one of them would believe us. Apparently, my grandpa was reading an address or something as he drove up and never saw the van, and my grandma was always convinced their street was the safest street in the history of all streets. Upon talking later as adults and revisiting the alley and park, Carly and I came to the same conclusion. Regardless of whatever creepy McCreeper had wanted from us, he had been stalking us for the very least a few days. As I said before, the crack was not visible in any shape or form. You couldn't even see it if you were taller than five feet due to the cramped space. Mr. Creeper had apparently watched us duck down at least once, and likely watched the alley end as well to know where we would come out. Carly swears she saw Mr. Creepy at the park later that summer, in that same charcoal gray dodge, but I never encountered him again. Sometimes he pops up in my memories, even 15 years later, and I think about this story. And to this day, I wonder what would have happened if I had followed Carly through that crack in the wall. Initial apologies for formatting, as this is getting typed up on my phone. I decided to post this after binging the sub and the Let's Not Mead podcast for a few days. I rarely remember that I have interesting stories to contribute to places like this. Okay, so around 9 or 10 years ago, I was living with my mom, dad, and older sister in an oldish house in a very small village. When I say small, I mean its only main feature was a small church and a few scattered houses occupied mostly by very old people. At the time, it was the summer, so I wasn't at school or anything, and since we were so far in the middle of nowhere, I spent most of that time at home glued to one screen or another. The usual routine was I'd wake up at around 10 or 11. By this point, mom, dad, and sister had all left for work, and so I had the house to myself. I'd go downstairs, make some toast, watch some random stuff on TV for an hour, before heading back to my room to continue with whatever game I was grinding through that particular day. The usual habits of a 17-year-old guy cut off from the world by many, many fields. I should give a quick rundown of our house. It was an older cottage with two rooms upstairs, mine and my sister's and everything else downstairs. As you walk up the stairs, you get to a very small landing, and could go either left to my room or immediately right to my sister's room. Basically, the way this was laid out was that I could sit in my room with the door open, and my sister's room is directly opposite. I should also mention that the ceilings in both our bedrooms were slanted. We were basically in a large attic where the roof slanted down. Because of where the slant met the wall, we had a crawl space that ran the length of the house on either side of the rooms, both with a small door to access them. These were mostly used for storing normal attic things like Christmas decorations and long-forgotten toys. The doors to these were thin little things, about four feet tall with a small handle on the outside. This is important, because turning these tiny doorknobs opened them, but only from the outside. If the door was pushed shut with you inside there, there was no way back out. I discovered this myself on more than one occasion. The door on my side ran along my room and along one wall in my sister's room, and hers ran along the other side along my room. This space was not very big. You had to crouch to stand in it, 
and most of the time you were in there you would be crawling on your hands and knees. Anyway, this one morning I'm awoken to a familiar noise. Some sort of small creature rustling around in the crawl space on my sister's side. I could hear this because my bed was against the wall that ran along it. It's not an unusual noise. Living in the countryside, we had mice almost constantly, and they pretty much had the run of the storage spaces, no matter how many traps were put down. I thought nothing of it, and got off and went to begin my morning ritual of toast and television. And the first odd thing I noticed while I was watching TV was that I could hear movement upstairs. My sister's room was directly above the living room, so I assumed she'd just not gone to work for that day for whatever reason, and I continued munching away. Around an hour or two later, I went back upstairs and booted up my PC. As I was waiting for it to turn on, I turned around to my open door and faced my sister's closed one. I realized it was quite late in the day, and she had yet to even leave her room. An odd thing since she normally parked up on the sofa in the living room on her days off and didn't move until our parents returned. We're not the most active family out there. I started to think that maybe she was at work and I'd imagine the noise from upstairs, but as I mused this, I noticed the crack of light at the bottom of her door as a shadow passed by it. Okay, so there's definitely someone in there. It must be her, right? I once again pushed it from my mind and went back to my PC. More time passed and the thought came back to me. Why would she be at home but not leave? She only has a small TV in her room and no books, so what had she been doing in there all day? I glanced back around and again I saw the shadow passing under the door. She was still moving around in there, so what was up? I finally decided to go and knock on her door. I knocked on it a few times and called out her name. No answer. Weird, but maybe she had headphones on or something. I knocked a bit harder again and said her name louder. No answer. Alright, I thought. Fuck this. I'm just going to go in. So I cracked open the door and peered around. I found an empty room. No one inside at all. Feeling slightly confused, but better that it was just my imagination, I stepped in properly and looked around, but I saw something that made me full-on panic. Near the bottom of her little door leading to the crawl space, there was a small hole that the mice had made to get in and out at the bottom. Really small, but just about big enough to fit half of your hand through. There, coming through that hole, were four fingers holding the door shut from the inside. At first, I thought, no, that can't be right. Don't be stupid. Until I watched them slowly creep back through the hole and disappear into the crawl space. I lost my shit. Very quietly, though, I might add, to my credit. I backed out of the room, shutting the door behind me and ran to mine. Being the stupid teenager I was, I grabbed what might be the most imposing weapon I could find the fake Winchester rifle cap gun I got from Disneyland a few years previous. I figured that if whoever was hiding in that bedroom didn't believe it was a real firearm, I could at least smack them with it. I ran off downstairs to where my dogs were on the far side of the house and called my mom who worked about a five minute drive away. She told me to stay put and that her and her manager were on their way and this time I made a small upgrade from fake plastic rifle to one of my dad's golf clubs. I felt much better with that choice. Finally, my mom and her boss John turn up, and I tell them everything leading up to this point. They say okay, and we all set off upstairs to investigate, me rather unheroically bringing up the rear with my golf club. I get into my sister's room and I point to the door. I'll never know if my mom is just hard as nails or massively stupid, but while John and I watch, she marches over to the door and yanks it open, sticks her head right in. A moment passes while she looks left and right, and John and I are preparing to yank her back from the clutches of the psycho hobo murderer hiding in there, before she shouts, Chris, what the fuck are you doing in there? Get out! Small amount of backstory. 
Chris was my sister's boyfriend. Unbeknownst to me, the night before, my dad had asked Chris to leave, as he had stayed with us for around five days at this point. He said, yep, that's cool. As far as mum and dad knew, he'd headed home. What really happened was that instead of leaving, he and my sister had planned to make it seem like he'd left, so that he could stay another night. He would then wake up before my mom shouted my sister up for work like she did every morning, and hide in the crawl space and sleep there until everyone had left for the day. The one small hitch in the plan that they did not think of was, you guessed it, me. They'd forgotten that I was home, and conveniently sat direct opposite the only exit for most of the day, so he was trapped inside that little crawl space. When I knocked, he hid himself behind the door and held it shut to prevent being locked in. Anyway, my mom swiftly told him to get the fuck out and not come back. Sadly, this was not the last time we saw this guy, as it turned out he'd stolen quite a lot of money from my sister's room while he'd been hiding out, and then, because my sister makes terrible decisions, got her pregnant and proceeded to smash windows trying to get at her and the baby around a year later. For a while, we lived in the same city, when I went to uni. He was spending time at the prison there for stabbing someone in a completely different town. What a super guy. Oh, and small topper to all of this. As I mentioned earlier, the only rooms upstairs are mine and my sister's bedrooms. He'd been in there for close to 14 hours, with no access to a toilet. But no worry for this guy, because he had lots of empty bottles to piss in which he kindly left behind for us to clean up. And finally, around a year later, his mum was getting the Christmas decorations out, which were at the far back of the storage space, she found a small bag filled with feces. I should mention where she found it is exactly where my bed is on the other side of the wall. The rustling that woke me up that day? It was him, hiding his shit amongst our tinsel and tree. So, sister's baby daddy who hid in our crawl space and used it as a private bathroom? Let's well, not meet, yeah. When I was 12 years old, my family and I lived in an old apartment complex. I say old because it's been standing for well over 50 years by the time we moved in. Some residents have even claimed to have lived there for their entire lives. Anyway, one particular thing that stuck out to me is that there was a strict no pets policy. The landlord actually elaborated on this, stating that a copious number of pets seemed to go missing around the area, and now they restricted pets in hopes that it would end that problem there. As a child, I pretty much kept to myself. As for my brothers, who are two or three years older than me, they spoke and played with every kid that lived in the apartments and surrounding areas. Every day after school, they'd beg our mother for some change, so they could visit the candy lady. She was a local resident in the apartments, who held a mini-mart in her apartment. Basically, she'd buy snacks in bulk, ranging from gummy snacks to chips, so she could resell it to the neighborhood kids. I'd never been at that point, but I was curious, of course. I'd asked my brothers if I could join them, and they declined. So I stole, I know, a dollar from my mom's purse. I followed my brothers and their friends, so I could find out where she lived. Upon stalking them, I finally found out her apartment location. Though they stayed inside for a while, I figured I'd just go the next day. The next day after school, I took my stolen dollar and headed out to the candy lady's apartment. When she opened the door, she was an older Caucasian lady with a very welcoming demeanor. She let me in and asked for my name. When I gave it to her, I asked for hers. She said to just call her the candy lady. She seemed sweet and thoughtful, asking me about school and if I lived in the area. Kids don't usually come here alone. Where are your friends? She asked me. I explained that I don't really have any, and that I prefer to just observe. She seemed to sympathize with me, because she then told me to take anything I wanted free of charge. As a child, I indulged, taking as much with me as I could carry. 
While thanking her on my way out, she turned and said to me, Come back any time, my friend. I felt pretty jolly at that point. One, I got free snacks, and two, I had actually made a friend. When I got home, I hid my snacks in my drawers, returned my mother's stolen dollar, and felt pretty great overall. That is, until I went back. I returned maybe three or four days after the first time. When I knocked, she answered the door frantically. I got a bit scared, so I told her I could just come back later if it was a bad time. After realizing it was me, though, she told me no worries and insisted I come in. When I did, she asked if I came back for some more free snacks. I gleefully told her yes, but she said that the first time was just a kind gesture. From now on, I'd have to help her with a few things to earn my free snacks. I was used to working for things at this point, so I agreed. It was simple enough, just throw out her trash for her. I figured she was old and probably couldn't make it outside much. The weird thing was, though, she had me take her garbage out to the dumpsters in the apartments next door. Fast forward to a month later, and it had become our regular schedule. After school, I'd do my homework, then head over to her place to throw out her garbage as well as collect my earnings. It was all easy breezy for a while. That is, until one day, she didn't tie the trash bag all the way. I walked all the way down to the dumpsters next door, and before I threw it in, I decided I'd tie it first. It was loose, so I had to untie it all the way to fix it. Curious little me couldn't help but take a peek inside. Inside, I saw wadded up paper towels, drenched in blood and hair. There were also more black plastic bags at the bottom of the bag. It freaked me out so much that I dropped the bag right then and there and ran all the way home. As soon as I got home, I cried to my mother about my discovery. She said she'd go out and see it for herself after I told her which dumpster. When she returned, she said she didn't see what was inside because the candy lady was already there throwing it out when she arrived. My mother didn't say a word to her and just left. She just told me that she didn't want me going out that far anymore and to stop helping with other people's chores, completely neglecting what I had initially told her. Surprisingly, I was able to just forget, more like ignore, what happened and go about my kid life like nothing ever occurred. Then my brothers came rushing back home one day. They anxiously explained to my mom who is as nosy as ever regarding neighbors, that the candy lady had been taken away by the police. My mother dismissed it and told us to mind our business. My brothers were bummed out though because of their future lack of snacks. As a child at this point in time, I didn't really understand police, so I was pretty much clueless about what happened. About a month ago, I had dinner with my mom. I'm now 22 years old, by the way. My mother and I got to reminiscing, and we started talking about those old apartments. After discussing how old and broken down they were, I asked her if she remembered what I told her I saw. At first, she didn't. Then I mentioned that she was arrested by the police. The shock of the realization hit her. She said she remembered, and that she actually asked the landlord about it shortly after she was taken away. Apparently, the landlord told her that the candy lady was actually killing and skinning animals she found nearby. She's the reason why pets weren't allowed. She was stealing them and killing them, and God knows doing what with the skin. And I'm the dumbass little kid who got rid of the evidence for her. For those of you wondering, the management of the apartments next to ours, the one with the dumpsters we used to dispose of the evidence in, caught wind of the smell reeking from the dumpsters. From there, they were able to catch the candy lady. All I know is, I'm glad I never went back once I realized what was in the bags of trash she had me take out multiple times. To the crazy candy lady, let's never meet again. And P.S. If you're the candy lady reading this, I refuse to believe you were my first friend. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here, as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, 
and especially if you made it this far to the end of the video, please be sure to like, share, or subscribe if you guys feel so inclined. I actually have a couple of announcements for you guys here at the end card today. So uh, first off, my friend Alan, who is an artist, uh, I've been working with him on some uh, designs for some merch for like t-shirts and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully those will be done pretty soon. I'm waiting to get a couple of designs done before I release those, so uh, hopefully you guys will be able to get those soon. Secondly, uh, he also offered to help me make some thumbnails for my videos so that I don't always have to make them myself. So uh, we'll probably be working together a lot in the future. So I'm going to be sure to link all of his social media and stuff in the description below because uh, he's a really good artist and he's a good friend of mine. So you guys should definitely go check out his work. Also, if you guys want to make sure to get all of the new notifications for when all of my videos come out, uh, make sure to click that little bell right next to the subscribe button and turn the notifications on to all. Because uh, if you set it to personalized, you won't always get the notifications for the channel. Uh, they'll just disappear sometimes, so that's how you get notifications for when the new videos are coming out. Uh, as always, links to all of my social media will be in the description below including my Twitter, Gmail, Facebook, and Twitch accounts. I also have a Discord now, so I'll probably be putting that in the description from now on as well. If you guys have a story that you would like me to read, or that you would like to share personally, uh, please be sure to send it to me in a message on either my Gmail or my Facebook, as those are what I check most often. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline the name of the story, what type of story it is, if it has one, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Uh, if you guys are curious about the music at all used in the videos, uh, the music is always listed in the description below the video in the order which it appears, and I also have links to the artists as well, so be sure to check them out. I think for now, that's everything though guys, so thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.